Hello and welcome everybody back to another episode of From the Heart. And what we're going to be doing today is placing our bets and racing off into another story from the Hellraiser comic book series. And this time, we will not only see some familiar faces such as Pinhead himself, but we will also be watching the creation of yet another Cenobite, and one that I've yet to see in any of the other stories. And I do gotta say, I think this might be one of the most brutal transformations that I have ever quite seen. But for this story, it's going to be leaning a little more heavily into the comedy aspect of these situations, and overall, I think it's just one of those more kind of fun Hellraiser stories that we get every once in a while that isn't just brutally sad or just brutally horrific, and I think it's going to be something that you'll all enjoy. And what this story would happen to be about is actually about a man who owns a racing horse, and when this horse continues to fail time and time again, he would end up getting infuriated, only until something would be brought to him, something that could potentially bolster his luck and increase the speed of his horse. Only what this thing would actually be is yet another unique puzzle item that I have also never seen. A stopwatch and something that would eventually stop this man's life. But yes everybody, I hope you enjoy this video and let's just get right down into it. And where the story would begin is at the horse track with our featured protagonist getting more and more angry. Come on you son of a bitch! Move your ass, damn it! And they're off! The Dyna Girl in front by a link. Followed closely by Cranky Day, Spank Me, and Lillian Surprise. All around the bend with Turbo Buffy and Kendu. And coming in the last heat, it's Dyna Girl by a nose with Spanky and Cranky Day. And in the next set of panels, we would see this man with the binoculars looking ever more increasingly mad, as this young girl beside him would continue the route for Dyna Girl, until inevitably and for no reason, her bra would snap and she would inevitably be exposed. Now, I don't know why this is in this story, but being Hellraiser, you always gotta be expecting a little bit of skin, and last but not least, a little bit of leather. But with the race coming to a conclusion, our main character would realize that it's over for him, that he has lost yet another gamble, and that this is going to be the last time he he will allow this, stating that I'll kill that good for nothing runt. And with the next panel, we would see him walking up to the horse stable, thinking to himself, what a stupid and useless horse this is, and picking up a broomstick next to the stall of the horse that just lost. Hey, what's going on? You're worthless! Now you wanna run, huh? And with these sad next set of panels, we would see this man literally beating this horse with a broomstick, trying to kind of whip in whatever kind of discipline this would even do, only to me, I would think this would probably, you know, put a lot of stress on this horse. But luckily enough, the head management of the stable will come out and reprimand this man and not only kick him off, but tell him that if this ever happens again, he will be disbarred from the horses. Cassidy, that's enough! This horse ain't fit for dog food. Stop it, for God's sakes, Cassidy! Get your hands off of me. It's my horse, and I'll do what I damn well please. If this happens one more time, so help me, Cassidy. We'll petition the stewards to have you barred from this track. Well, you just bought yourself a lot of trouble, Hamel. I'll settle up with you a little later, when it's a little more private. And you, Weiss, I want to talk to you in the tack room. Now! And with the next couple of panels, we would essentially learn that Cassidy has been working with this man Weiss to literally feed this horse cocaine. Now, I don't know if this is something that has really ever been done in the horse racing track of history, although now when I do think about it, I can almost for sure assume that some terrible person has done this. But as Cassidy would yell and shout at this man Weiss for not feeding him enough of this cocaine, Weiss would essentially tell him that there's no point anymore, that essentially this horse is all used up, and that no mountain of cocaine in the world is ever going to bring this this horse back, and that if he continues to do so, he's just going to have a dead racehorse on his hands. And with Weiss kind of standing up for himself, Cassidy would inevitably fire this man and tell him to leave the premises at once. And with Cassidy leaving the stable himself, we would see him get into his car and grab a bottle of liquor off the front dash, leading on to the next morning in a hungover state that has become all too familiar for this man. And as the next day approaches, Cassidy will be met by a strange and mysterious figure completely covered by flies and a man that I honestly automatically knew wasn't quite right, and would possibly even be working for the Cenobites, as it would seem that this man is almost dead by the look of his eyes, by the stench that would follow him around everywhere, as well as the vermin that would crawl off and on his skin. Hey Cassidy, how about a fin? Get out of my face, winehead. You smell like shit. But I have something you really like here. A one of a kind. I already got a stopwatch. Not like this one. It makes any horse you clock run faster than ever before. Oh yeah? Well why don't you just go ahead and piss off? I'll prove it. 
on your own horse. And as this strange man says this to Cassidy, we would see a grin amounting on this man's face, and deciding that why the hell not? Why not give this man a chance? And if it can actually better his horse, then why not take the leap? After all, this horse is essentially dead, it is essentially ruined. And as Cassidy would yell over to the man riding this horse, telling him to give it all he's got, the next couple of panels would show that this mysterious golden stopwatch would indeed seem to be tracking faster with this horse, to actually put some kind of supernatural element into its heels, into its stride. And as he stands there with his mouth agape, the man offering the stopwatch would merely tell him that you've never seen any kind of stopwatch like this. And this really does manage to be one of the strangest puzzles that I've ever really quite seen. We've literally seen a maze of dirt tunnels being a puzzle. We've seen a childhood book. We've seen a book of poetry. We've seen the common gold box that is seemingly labeled everywhere. But for this mysterious puzzle, it would seem to literally be made just to fish Cassidy to the bowels of hell. And actually seeing this thing work, Cassidy would agree. I'll give you five bucks for it. Five bucks? You know what this thing's worth? Yeah, five bucks. Take it or take nothing, Winehead. Oh, come on, man. I'm sick and I can't... I gotta get better. There. It's a deal. I'll see you around. And with the next couple of panels, we would see the strange man walking off with a certain smirk about his face. And right off the heels of this, we would see Cassidy walking into a bar and reaching into his pocket for a flask. But when he does this, it would seem that the stopwatch would completely fall out of his pocket and essentially shatter against the floor into a million different pieces into some sort of a beautiful jigsaw puzzle. And as Cassidy cries out, we would cut over to the next panel and we would see this man walking into a store where there would be a man who could possibly fix this puzzle for him. Him. What do you mean you can't fix it for Christ's sake? Sir, I fix all sorts of watches and clocks. It's been my profession for over 30 years, and I'm really quite good at it. And I assure you, this is not a watch. And frankly, I don't know what you got there. I've never seen anything like it. It's a puzzle to me. And right there, with this invitation of hell being so out in the open, Cassidy would go on to essentially hunt down this strange fly-ridden man who he basically stole this watch from, only giving him $5, and I gotta say, this man truly does get what he deserves. He is a person that has no problem with beating horses, feeding them drugs, and treating the less fortunate with absolutely no respect at all. But after not being able to find this strange man in any bar or tavern, Cassidy would begin to think that maybe he can fix his watch watch for himself. It's like I told you, man. That winehead's been dead for a month. I was just talking with him the other day. You're thinking of somebody else. I know what I know. And that old winehead's been dead, man. Damn. Just what the hell's going on here? I'll figure it out if it kills me. Screw all of them. And with the next panel, it would seem that Cassidy is able to assemble all these different golden pieces into what would resemble a stopwatch, but something that would become something much more terrible. Something that would take this man to the destiny that he never knew he wanted. As we cut to the next page and watch Cassidy festering over the stopwatch, and suddenly the wine head would appear out of nowhere, only this time seeming much, much more ominous. Well done, Cassidy. Almost a record time. What the? Jeez, don't just sneak up on me like that. You, where the hell have you been? Been looking all over for you. Oh, I've been very busy lately, scouting new talent for the bosses. And anyway, I knew the puzzle was good in your hands. Scouting? You? You don't know nothing about the ponies. Probably more like scouting a can of Stono. Where it is that you're dead, pal. That's the kind of impression you make on folks. Yes, well, I'll show you something rather impressive right now. After all, you placed your trust in a watch that only delivered illusions, and you solved the puzzle. You should be rewarded for your efforts. And suddenly the winehead would pull out a strange hook that would be all too familiar for anybody who has dealt in these Hellraiser comics or seen any of the movies. As he would begin to explain to himself that it's getting a little bit warm in here, and actually putting this thing up to his face and beginning to peel his skin, and with the next coming panels we would see this man essentially turning into a strange monster that we've never really seen throughout this franchise, into something that would come straight out of an 80s horror movie, and Cassidy would only continue the look in shock. Until inevitably, this thing would grab him and show him such sights that Cassidy has never seen before. And probably one of the scariest depictions of hell that I've seen in the Hellraiser franchise. It's very vivid. I love the color palettes of this comic book. I think while it is pretty cartoony, and after all, I gotta say, this thing is just an all-around fun read. Watching Cassidy basically get what was coming to him until he is tasked with the final challenge to become one of the Cenobites. In one of the most horrific killings I've seen. And as the creature would go on to 
the laugh of this man. We look over to the strange hellscape as Cassidy would continue to yell out for God, only in this strange place there would be none. And suddenly, Cassidy will be cast down to the pits of the damned. The operatic sound of a billion souls being tortured fills the air. Or is that a billion and one? And as Cassidy would fall and fall to the depths of hell, the coming panels would only show the torture to come. As with the first panel, we would see Cassidy being regurgitated by a giant spiked worm, straight into a pool of boiling blood as a bunch of monsters begin to encircle this man, and entering his mouth with their strange tendrils, until eventually they had all be pulled away by what would seem to be a varying chains. And as we see Cassidy looking out towards the horror, we would be once again greeted by the all-time Cenobite, Pinhead himself. Welcome to hell, Mr. Cassidy. Please! Oh, please don't kill me! I'm sorry for what I've done! Maybe you could give me another chance! I'll change! Yes, indeed, Mr. Cassidy. You will change. Let's not hear any more sorry nonsense, or we'll change our minds. You see, you've been recruited in a sense. Recruited for what? Tortures of the damned, of course. Oh, God, no! Yes, Mr. Cassidy. You misunderstand us, Mr. Cassidy. We've been admiring your application of discipline. W what do you mean? We have a unique experience planned for you. A training program, if you will. You will be born again, Mr. Cassidy. Not of woman, but of hellfire. After your transformation in the creation chamber, you will become one of us. The elite. The beautiful and the powerful. A Cenobite. Our Lord Leviathan's front line in the war against the flesh. You mean I'll get to call the shots? I'll get to torture the others. Yes, deliciously, eternally. After a fashion, of course. First, you will need to be reordered. You're very lucky, Mr. Cassidy. Yeah, I am lucky, finally. It's like the horses finally come in. So where do I line up? And how long before I can start? We have such sights to show you, but such things can't be rushed. In a way, I guess this is what I've been working for my entire life. Yes, an afterlife. Only with the next panel, it would show us a challenge that I'm not really quite sure anybody really could sit forward and actually go through without doing what it is this man needs to do. And suddenly Cassidy would realize what exactly is about to happen to this man. Cassidy is led to the creation chamber, a glowing cell filled with impossible number of burning horses. The rise, a flame. I thought he'd be different. He seemed to welcome recruitment. No, the flesh is always unstructured at the last. They never appreciate Leviathan's gift, but he will, in time. I think we'll call him the trainer, if he masters the discipline to stop screaming. And this would essentially be the end of our story. And like I said, one of the most gruesome killings that I've really seen in the Hellraiser franchise. We've seen some very disturbing ones, and some ones that, you know, really bothered me. Especially the ones with the origin of face, with drowning, whatever that was in the basin. You know, these were hard things for me to read and then to make a video out of. But to be eaten alive by flaming horses, and to have to not let out any sort of scream on in order to become a part of Leviathan itself, just seems to be one of the, you know, more harder task, and I would kind of challenge you all to find me an even harder challenge throughout the Hellraiser franchise. I think, you know, that could be fun. That's kind of a fun, you know, uh, Easter egg hunt, if you will. But overall, I thought this was, you know, kind of a very fun story. You know, there's parts of it that are unpleasant, but to actually see such an asshole of a man kind of get what's coming to him was something that felt good, that we don't usually get in the Hellraiser franchise, because usually the terrible, terrible people end up being, you know, recruited by Leviathan and get changed into one of these Cenobites. And it's just something that I found rather refreshing. And with all of it, I really dug the art style as well. Like I said before, it's all very vibrant. It's all very cartoony. But when you kind of mix these things with the ultra violence of Hellraiser, it kind of, you know, makes something that stirs something in you. Something that tells you, wow, these are happy colors, but there's nothing happy really going on. And in fact, there's actually a story by the same artist and I believe the second Hellraiser book, a story that I don't even think I can cover on this channel because of how uncomfortable it is. The story of a writer who essentially will become a Cenobite and the whole thing is just kind of a ploy to talk about, you know, when you are a writer and you have to go through editors and they have to kind of take things out of your plot or change up the twist. And it's another story that I found very interesting that maybe someday I'll find a way to kind of convey that to you all without uh, showing some of the terrible, terrible imagery of that story. But anyways, everybody, thank you all so much for watching. Um, this was definitely one of the more fun Hellraiser stories, one of the 
I don't even know how I'm about to say this, but one of the more light-hearted stories, if you will. But nonetheless, something that I think we can kind of all enjoy, and uh, I'm pretty sure this will be a shorter episode. I'm kind of, you know, I'm kind of in a lull of what exactly I want to cover, you know, my next big segment. I think I'd like to do one more other story out of Swan Songs, and then after that, I'm not sure. I actually think I want to dip into the Yu-Gi-Oh! manga, so let me know if that interests any of you guys. Don't think about the card game. The manga is something entirely different, something very funny, and at the same time, very insane. And if you're somebody who's only seen the anime or played the card game, something that you probably want to expect, so... Yeah, let me know down in the comments maybe some things you guys might want to see me cover. And also, I'm sorry that there will be no Conker's Bad Fur Day this week. Uh, kind of got busy over the weekends and couldn't really find the time to record it. But I think we have maybe two more episodes on that, so we'll get on the next one. And anyways, everybody, thank you so much for watching. I appreciate you all, and I hope you have an absolutely fantastic weekend. And I'll see you on the next episode of From the Heart.